What does it mean to be a member of a church, or a member of the church for that matter? Um, I think that one of the biggest mistakes I have personally encountered in people who talk about church membership is that they really don't understand what the word member means. And this is something I have encountered among a lot of brethren. Uh, in our modern society, when I talk about being a member of something, you might think in terms of being a member of a club or an organization, being a member of the uh, Rotary Club, or a member of some kind of special society, or things like that. And what it means, essentially, is that you have your name on a roster somewhere. Uh, you may not really be super involved in that particular group or organization. You may come to a couple of meetings here or there. You may not even come to any meetings, but you still consider yourself a member of that group because, you know, of this definition our society has of membership. The problem with this idea is that the Bible never uses the word membership, member, in this way, ever. In fact, the only way that the Bible ever uses the word member, as we would think of it, is in talking about a probably less invoked English usage of member in that we're talking about body parts, is what we're talking about. You know, for example, if I talk about my arms and my legs, those are members of my body. Um, and you know, that's a little bit more of an older use of member and kind of... Uh, but it's still a valid definition, and it's the we got to understand that every time the Bible talks about being a member of a church, it is always talking about it in terms of being a member of the body, a part of the body. Um, it's never used in this sense of, oh, well, I got my name in a directory somewhere. Maybe I have an asterisk next to my name in that directory. I don't know. That's not what the Bible is really talking about when it talks about membership in a church. Now, I cannot claim to be a member in a local church if I only show up occasionally. I can't, my hand or foot doesn't say, well, I'm, all, I'm only going to be like member of the body on Sundays or I'm going to be a member of the body on Thursdays only. You know, because what is that, really? That person is a perpetual amputee. That person is, has no real, uh, you know, there's chaos is what that is. That's not a body anymore. That's a monstrosity. It is something that defies all understanding of anatomy and physiology whatsoever. Now, I'm not going to talk about attendance tonight because that's really kind of, uh, it's kind of silly to talk to about attendance to your Sunday night audience. That just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, in fact, it's really kind of silly to preach about attendance because the people you're preaching to are the ones that are there. So, it's like, what do you do? <laughs> you know, maybe you can get the people who think it's okay to only show up to one service on Sunday morning, but that's another issue at another time that we will deal with. Tonight, I want to talk about the body of Christ, specifically in how it relates to the church. And so this is what we'll look at is the church as Christ's body. When we talk about the church as the body, Paul's writings are the ones that we are mainly going to be looking at. Um, and I think one thing we do need to be careful is that there are actually two ways in which Paul uses this body imagery, and we'll discuss this as we go throughout. Of course, one day, way that Paul uses the body is to describe Christ as the head of that body. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, Paul writes, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And He put all things in subjection under His feet and gave Him as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Christ is the head of the body, and the body, which is the church, is in submission to Him. Now, we're talking about the universal church here. We're talking about the collective group of all of God's saved people. But really, this is part of the long-standing process that the Scripture depicts of taking everything that is in this world, everything that is part of existence, and submitting it to the will of Christ. And how many bodies are there? You know, do we have one head with two bodies, or... One body with two heads? No, we don't, because that would be a little bit monstrous. Again, any time your church, if you, if, you, if you put your church in a body analogy, and it turns out looking like something that came out of a monster movie, you know, you're having some problems. 
Now, we're, Ephesians chapter 4 says, I, am, I, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with all patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were also called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all all and in all. Does Paul have a favorite number in this passage? <laughs> number one. There's only one body, and clearly, again, we're talking about the universal church, not the local. The local is, there's a lot of local churches out there. That's just a truism. And what must this body do? This body must grow up. This body must mature. And for that to happen, the individual members of the body must be striving for maturity so that they can grow up in all respects into the head. If you keep reading in Ephesians 4, it says, in the beginning of verse 7, to each one of us, in other words, each of us individuals, was grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives and gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all things, so that he might fill all things. You know, he quotes from Psalm 68 there, and uh, he actually changes the quote a little bit. If you go back and read Psalm 68 in context, we're not going to do that tonight. That's another lesson. But, uh, but the, I mean, the point is that you know, when Christ descended, he gave gifts to people. He gave gifts to these people who would be the individual members of the body. And he gave some, verse 11, as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors. That is, teachers. These are all words for teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to what? We are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now, a lot of things we can say. Uh, I mean, the prime thing that comes out in this, though, is that the function of those who are members of the body of Christ... They are required to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. They are required to grow up, to mature, to become more like their head, Christ, who sets the example for them. In Ephesians 5, Paul mixes the metaphor a little bit with between the head and the body and between the husband and wife imagery. Wives, verse 22 of Ephesians 5, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or any or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. There again, we have the mixed metaphor, but we also have that statement, we are members of His body. Does that mean that there's a sign-up sheet in His body or a directory in His body with a bunch of telephone numbers and asterisks with our names on it? No. When we talk about being members of His body, we are talking about the arms and the legs and the fingers and the toes and all of the other ligaments that are being joined together to form a complete and whole person. And if the body is missing something that's essential, well, it's a deformed body. It's not a functioning body at that point. And the goal of Christ is to present the church, the universal church, as His bride, holy and blameless before Him. 
And when Christ returns in all of His glory, that's what's going to happen. The bride of Christ, the body of Christ will be presented as sanctified before God. Now, we, there's a couple of other passages that we could go to to talk about this. Colossians chapter 1 and verses 15 through 20. Uh, in Colossians chapter 1, Paul draws a parallel between the old creation and the new creation. Between the, first, the fact that Christ is the firstborn of creation and the fact that Christ is the firstborn from the dead. Beginning in verse 15 of Colossians 1, He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. Why does creation exist? To glorify God. To glorify Christ. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body. The church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through Him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now that last bit there, verse 20, says something about what, what, how this body is even going to be joined together in the first place. You know, we live in a world that is corrupted, divided. It seems like groups of people can't settle their differences and learn to get along with one another. But Christ provides the answer to that. Christ provides the key for taking all of those of different backgrounds and persuasions in this world and making them into one person and one body. And that key is the peace He has made, in verse 20, through the blood of His cross. It is the sacrifice of Christ by which this body will ever be, by which this body will be sanctified. Christ's position as the head of the body is a direct result of His actions on the cross, according to verse 20. And this is going to be important as we go through this. In verse 21, Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death, in order to present him before you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister." Christ's goal is to present us holy and blameless. How is He going to do this? He reconciles us through His body. Well, what body are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the body of Jesus that was offered on the cross. The body of Jesus that we remember was given for us when we eat the bread at the table of the Lord. That body of Christ is how we are reconciled together. But you keep reading in verse 24, and Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do share my behalf, but my share on behalf of His body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. You see how the metaphor is actually being mixed a little bit here, because on the one hand, the body of Christ is clearly talking about His physical body that was sacrificed on the cross. But on the other hand, Paul then turns around and says, but the body is really the church. How does that work? Well, Paul is able to make these, these mixed metaphors here, uh, it's done on purpose. Christ, Christ in His body suffered for our sins. Because of this, Paul in turn suffers on behalf of the body. Paul sacrifices himself for the body. When, when, Paul, was in, when Paul wrote Colossians, he was in prison. He was suffering for the cause of Christ. He was standing before the Roman, uh, the Roman guards proclaiming the gospel. And he was in chains because he was suffering on behalf of that body. In the context, he imitates the sufferings of Christ's physical body, but explicitly says that those sufferings are on behalf of the body which is the church. As a result of what Christ has done with his body, how should the body of Christ behave? Well, you, be, you push a little bit further into Colossians. And Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12, talks about the body once again. 
Beginning in verse 12, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. We need to have this attitude of love towards one another. As individual Christians, as Christians in general, need to have love for one another. It's a fact. We need to have compassion. We need to have kindness. We need to have humility. We need to have gentleness and patience and all these things he lists here. But then he talks about letting the peace of Christ dwell in you. In verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. The fact that we are one body means we should be letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. And be thankful, he says. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell richly within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And the point of that isn't, you know, I don't think Paul was even thinking about instrumental music when he wrote that. His main point that he was making is that we should be encouraging and admonishing one another with these songs. And that's one of the ways that we do it. You know, there, there's that positive command to you know, sing to one another. And that that is to be used as a teaching tool. We don't participate in singing to one another. Are we doing what this passage says? No, we're not. And in verse 17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. That's how the body should behave. Everything... It does. Everything every member does needs to be done in the name of Christ, to the glory of Christ. Everything. Surely you can't mean everything, Jesus. You know, we're talking, can I eat dinner in the name of Christ? Can I go take a nap in the name of Christ? Can I do those things? Well, absolutely you can. God created us to do those things. It's not like those things are inherently evil somehow. Um, you know, those are functions which God gave us and created the need for us in. But the problem is that when we don't do those things to the glory of Christ, when we don't do those things in the name of Jesus, when we don't participate in activities like eating and sleeping and drinking and breathing even, without, if we participate in those activities without the recognition that God is the one that gave us the need and the capacity to do those things, we are not doing them to His glory. We are not doing them to His benefit. And we are not functioning as the part of the body that we should. We're not allowing the peace of Christ and the Word of Christ to dwell within us in this context. That's what it means for Christ to be the head of the body. It means that Christ owns our lives. And we do nothing save what He would have us do. That says something about it's not just our actions either, it's our speech. You think about it, you know. Am I going to make, make nasty comments at people in the name of Christ? Am I going to gossip about my brethren in the name of Christ? Am I going to talk bad about people behind their back in the name of Christ? Well, you know, when you start seeing your life in that perspective of what it means to do things in the name of the Lord Jesus, suddenly, oh, that gives a little perspective to the whole thing, doesn't it? way that the Bible talks about the church being the body is more in a uh, sense where, uh, which talks about the function of its members. Uh, and 1 Corinthians 12 is perhaps the most um, clear example of this. And one thing we need to understand as we read 1 Corinthians 12 is while Paul is talking about the church being the body, he's not making the same points of comparison throughout. Uh, for instance, in Ephesians and Colossians, Christ is the head of the body. But when we get to 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about people who are eyes and people who are ears and people who are mouths and nose and all that. Well, aren't those part of the head? And the point in this passage, Christ is actually not the head in the analogy in 1 Corinthians 12. He is the life-giving spirit that gives life to that body. But more on that in a moment. 1 Corinthians 12 um, is basically the beginning of Paul's discussion on the problem of spiritual gifts at Corinth. Paul always introduces a new subject in 1 Corinthians with the expression, now concerning, uh, in chapter 12 and verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts or things of the Spirit. 
The main problem that the Corinthians had was a false view of their own spiritual superiority. They believed that they were better than other people because they had certain gifts. And the fact that Paul lists tongues as the last item in every single gift list in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 suggests that it's probably tongues that are the key divisive issue here. The ability to speak in other languages without having previously learned those. The problem was that the Corinthians were using these spiritual gifts for promoting self, which is not a spiritual activity at all, really. It is the opposite of what it means to be spiritual. It is the opposite of a crucified Christ. And it guts the very meaning of the body of Christ because it does things the opposite of the way Christ would do them. And so throughout chapters 12, and through 12, 13, and 14, Paul asserts that true spirituality is wrapped up in the concept of love and edification. So much so that the very heart and soul of the chapter, here's chapter 13, is not a tangent. It's the point of the whole thing. The need for love. If you don't have love, then all of the spiritual gifts you have, all of the abilities you have, all of the accomplishments that you have, mean absolutely nothing. Because you do not have love, he says. Now, let's read. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 12, Paul says, Concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There's the criteria right there for being a spiritual person. And it's not just a verbal confession. It's not just you say the words, Jesus is Lord. Well, you know, your actions must also back up that verbal statement there. In verse 4, now he begins talking about the need for diversity within the body of Christ. And what he says here is actually true of both the universal church in that there is a need for great diversity within the body of God's people. But also it's true of local churches, which are a model or a type of what universal congregation is. In verse 4, there are a varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Now, you get to that, and we're not going to go through all these spiritual gifts and what they mean. That's another lesson again. The point of all this is that just because we are one body, just because we are one unified group of God's people, does not mean that every person in that body has to be the same. In fact, we should expect people to be different because the Spirit distributes different gifts to different people, he says. Now, we don't have miraculous gifts today, but by and large, there's a principle we can understand that not everybody within the body is the same. Not everybody performs the same function. Not everybody does the same things. Not everybody has the same set of special skills. And then Paul uses the body as an example. He says, even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. That's what Christ is like. Many members, but really one body. Why? Verse 13, By one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. The body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, huh, Because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it's not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, well, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as He desired. If they were all one member, where would the whole body be? 
For now there are many members, but one body. And then Paul uses, is using a series of, again, monster movie absurd illustrations to make a point here. Uh, you know, the foot, you know, my foot has never walked off and said, you know what, I'm jealous of the hand, I'm not going to be a, I don't want to be a foot anymore. And it walks off and leaves me. I was like, that's not good. You know, my ears have never walked off saying that they didn't, they, they don't like their job, they want to be eyes. My ears have given me other troubles in my life, but that's not one of them. Um... I mean, but even a bigger absurdity than that, what would happen if everybody in the body was an eye? What would happen if the whole body was an eye? You don't have a body anymore. You have a monstrosity. You have something that looks like it came out of a monster movie. If the body were an ear, well, then that's not going to smell very good. This is not a body at all. It's a perversion. It's a monstrosity. It's a deformity. And the same point goes that the body parts can't kick each other out. In verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, oh, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And, you know, he might be talking about internal organs there, weaker parts of the body, but you take one of those out, you're in trouble. <laughs> and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, on our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacks, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. The eye can't kick the hand out. The hand can't kick. The head can't kick the feet out. You'll notice again, the head in this analogy is not Christ. Uh, there's a tendency to confuse the body analogy from Ephesians and Colossians, where Christ is the head, with what we've got going on in 1 Corinthians, where the head is just another body part, just another member. Christ is the spirit that gives life to the body, uh, similar to what we have in Romans chapter 8. Uh, but those weaker members are the ones that are necessary, it says. They seem to be weaker, but they're really not. They're really the glue holding this whole thing together, aren't they? You know, I mean, it's like my stomach and my lungs and my heart. Those things are, those things are weak body parts. They can't survive outside. That's why they've got to have all this protective caging and coating here. But... Really, they're absolutely essential. body wouldn't last without them. The unpresentable members, probably talking about sexual organs here, not only can body parts not say, I don't need you, but sometimes you know, certain parts of the body that are less presentable still get special treatment in certain contexts. It's all part of God's design. It's all part of God's wisdom. Just as God knew what He was doing when He designed the body, He knew what He was doing when He designed the church. Sometimes there's stuff in the body that shouldn't be there. Um, James likes to talk about blood-sucking parasites in the body. Uh, you know, then there's that, that problem in and of itself. You know, if you're part of the body, you need to be a part of the body that contributes to the body. Otherwise, what are you? Well, you're a giant cancerous tumor. You're a blood-sucking parasite. You're a member of the body that's acting in a way it shouldn't. Cell multiplication in a way it shouldn't happen. Or, you know, muscle spasmings in the way that they shouldn't happen because they're no longer functioning with the rest of the body. Oh, well, you need to do something about that. You need to fix that one way or another. And the end result of all of it, verses 25 and 26, is unity. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. One member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Mutual suffering... Mutual rejoicing. What does our congregation look like here? Is that true of us? When there's a member in this congregation, in this body here, suffering, do we suffer along with them? When there's someone here rejoicing, do we rejoice along with them? Well, if we don't, maybe we don't have the ideal situation that's being described here. Maybe we don't have this body that, Christ, that Paul describes. It's not a good thing. You need to fix that. And so as Christians, we must strive to grow closer in our relationships with one another. We must strive to adhere to one another in such a way that when one of us suffers, everybody knows it. And everybody sympathizes with it. And when one of us rejoices, everybody knows that too. And everybody 
rejoices along with them. If you don't have mutual suffering and you don't have mutual rejoicing, you don't have unity. That's the litmus test that Paul gives here. Now, does unity mean that everybody has to be the same? Everybody has to be the same cookie-cutter Christian who has the same ideas about everything? No. And in fact, Paul says the next, in the very next section, that verses 27 through 31, that unity is not the same thing as uniformity. You are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? Well, no one here is an apostle. All are not prophets, are they? Well, no, no, I don't know any prophets. Uh, all are not teachers, are they? Well, some people here are teachers and some people are not. All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. And I show you a still more excellent way. You know, there's one gift that everybody can have. There's one gift that everybody can exercise. And it's called the love. Because even if you could speak in every language known to man, and even an angelic language on top of that, you don't... It doesn't mean anything if you don't have love. Even if you could, you know, even if you gave away all your stuff to the poor, you know, look at how generous I am, but you don't really have love, it doesn't profit you anything. It's interesting there that, uh, you know, 13.3, that giving to the poor is not the same thing as showing compassion or love for people. You know, he talks about this unfailing, never-ending concept of love. That's what it means to be part of the body. How deep does that love go? How deep does that treatment of one another go? How do we know how to function as a body? Oh, well, Christ has given us the answer to that too. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus talks about His body. And I'm, going, I'm purposefully going to Luke because it's the least read of the Lord's Supper accounts. But in Luke 22... Uh, Luke's account is actually much longer than Matthew's and Mark's of this, by the way. But beginning in verse 14, The hour had come, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with them. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, from now on until the kingdom of God comes. When he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. They began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. Now, Luke, Luke's account of the Lord's Supper is much longer, and Luke is the only writer uh, between Matthew, Mark, and Luke who recorded this, who mentions afterwards that Jesus says, by the way, the betrayer's here. In all the other Gospels, he mentions it before this event. Well, of course... The mention of the betrayer prompts a discussion on the part of the disciples. Every time in Luke that Jesus predicts his death, the disciples do something foolish. And in verse 24, there arose a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you. The one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, the leader like the servant. For who is greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Jesus didn't lord it over his disciples. He didn't put himself on the pedestal and say, you must you know, submit to my will or else. He was among them as one who serves. And because of that, he earns the right to be submitted to as the head of the body. But he gives his disciples this memorial on this occasion that the bread symbolizes the body that Christ gave for his disciples. Jesus did that for all of his disciples. Jesus laid down his life for all of them. 
even Judas, whom he washed the feet of on that particular occasion, even Judas was one whom he became a servant to and showed mercy to. The greatest in the kingdom is the one who makes himself the slave and the servant. The one who makes himself like Christ in the ultimate, selfless, submissive, sacrificial, suffering service. The meaning of the body of Christ determines how we treat those who are part of the body of Christ. And nowhere is this more clear than in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the oft-read passage about the Lord's Supper, uh, there's a lot of controversy over this passage, so I'll just, but we'll read nonetheless um, this section here. Verse 17, In giving this instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved among you become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? And this I will not praise you. Now, you know, I mean, the point of this is not eating in houses versus eating in church buildings. That's not the point of this, because they were meeting in houses in the first century. Um, but what, what we have here, more or less, is Paul says you're shaming the poor, is what you're really doing. You're taking your fellow Christians, and you're treating them like dirt just because they're poor. Now, Paul's not happy about this. He's angry. He says in the first place, and he never says in the second place, which shows that he's just really, really upset with them. But there's a very simple answer to this, he says. This is also, by the way, the only time the phrase Lord's Supper appears in the Scriptures. Uh, and he contrasts it with one's own supper. You're not eating the Lord's Supper. He says, you're eating your own supper. You're doing your own thing. You're being your own people. You're feasting on your own feast. Stuffing your faces and shaming your poor brother. The solution to that goes back to Jesus. In verse 23, he said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. He describes the story that we just read in Luke. He emphasizes the fact that Jesus was betrayed on the night that he did this. Raises the question of just who the betrayer is at Corinth. Who's the betrayer when we gather around the table of the Lord? The Lord's Supper is both the body and the blood of the Lord, he says. And a failure to acknowledge the worth of the body will make one guilty of that body. Picking up in verse 27, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And for this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. When we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Verse 29 is the key to this whole thing. What does it mean to judge the body rightly? Are we talking about the bread and how it symbolizes the body of Christ? Later on, he says, if we judged ourselves rightly, is he talking about the body of Christ in terms of the congregation, the church? I saw a rather heated argument about which one it must be. And, you know, so, people, so many people were certain that they were right about this. Why do we have to choose between them? Why can't Paul be making a deliberate play on words here? There's an intentional double meaning of body. Paul's point is that the meaning of Christ's body encapsulated in the bread, encapsulated in the ritual of the Lord's Supper, the meaning of that influences how you treat the body, the church, how you treat its members, how you treat those who are part of it. And if you really cared about the sacrifice that Jesus made for you, about the fact that He offered His body for you, you would treat His body as if it were something special, as if it were something that you love, 
And I don't think this is a stretch because Paul makes the exact same word play in chapter 10. When he says that is not the cup of blessing which we bless, a sharing in the blood of Christ is not the bread which we break, a sharing in the body of Christ. Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. One body breaks one bread. And they have, in that context of chapter 10, no business monkeying around with other religious bodies like the idol cults and so on. Therefore, verses 33 through 34, chapter 11. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Love of Christ. When we talk about eating the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, I, you know, I, I used to have this idea in my head that eating in an unworthy manner, oh, you don't want to do that, that's dangerous. So my solution to that was, you know, focus really hard, really intensely. For five, you know, the five minutes we're taking the Lord's Supper, just think about the death of Christ. I don't know, visualize it or something like that. But that's not what Paul's talking about, is it? Is our worthiness to take the body and blood of the Lord dependent on what we're doing for five minutes of the week? Or is it dependent on who we are the rest of the time? If we come in and eat of the body and blood of the Lord and then treat those who are members of the body of Christ as if we were interested in self-inflicted wounds and acting like blood-sucking parasites and any number of other things, what are we really doing? What are we really saying about what we think of the body of Christ? We don't think much of the body of Christ at all if we act that way. And no amount of visualization will fix that. We truly respect the body and blood of the Lord. We will respect the body of the Lord as our congregation. We'll show the love for one another that He showed for us. We will, when we come to the table of the Lord, we join either with the Lord or with and His disciples or with His betrayer, who had no respect for His body, who had no respect for His person, and who had no respect for His people. And so the conclusion of the matter is simple. As we close this evening... Since you are part of the body of Christ, act like it. And if you are the body of Christ, it stands to reason that you should imitate Christ, right? That means you take up the cross and follow Him. That means we love as Christ loved. He is our head. He is our life. To Him be all praise and all glory forever and ever. If there's anyone here tonight that has not lived as members of the body should live, let it be known. All together we stand and we sing. So come to